Yeah, so my talk um, very nicely piggybacks off of the talk that Marina just gave um, because I'm going to be talking about primate hibernation. Um, right, so um, animals have developed numerous tactics to combat living um, in environments such as this um, that morph from being very green and lush to very um, white and cold. Uh, this is actually a picture of my parents' backyard in Wisconsin. Um, and I also have developed a tactic, um, and that was moving to North Carolina um, <laughs> to do my graduate work, which is what I'm going to be telling you about um, here. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about physiological adaptations and not behavioral adaptations. Um, one can argue that seasonal heterothermy is one of the most extreme physiological adaptations that an animal can use to escape these very seasonal environments. Um, so if you've seen me give a talk before, you've seen this graph before. Um, and that is because this graph perfectly demonstrates um, what a typical seasonal heterotherm looks like uh, during the winter. So uh, basically, what happens to this animal is that during torpor, um, that's depicted down here, body temperature and metabolic rate are reduced to very low levels. And these periods of torpor, which last about one to two weeks, um, are then punctuated by brief periods of um, rewarming known as interbout arousals, which are depicted up here. And then this collection of torpor bouts and interbout arousals then comprise the hibernation season. Um, and one thing I love about this graph is that you'll see here on the dotted line, um, that's actually soil temperature that was taken from the animal, in this case it's an arctic ground squirrel in Alaska. Um, the soil temperature data was taken from a data logger that was placed right next to the animal. Um, so you can see that soil temperature is dipping well below zero, but the body temperature is remaining um, right, uh, actually below zero. And this demonstrates the fact that body temperature doesn't drop just sort of willy-nilly, but it's actually um, continually defended even though it's at a lower set point. So um, because hibernation is typically thought of, as Marina said and showed a very similar picture, um, as a cold adapted behavior, the majority of hibernation research has focused on cold adapted species, um, such as the ones we see here, the American black bear, 13 line ground squirrels, marmots, um, and for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be referring to these as our model mammalian hibernators. But what if you're a species living in an environment such as this? So for many of you in the audience, this might look familiar. Uh, this is Corindy Forest. Um, Corindy experiences intense seasonality um, in its rainfall patterns. So it can it go up to eight months out of the year without experiencing any rainfall, um, as shown in the graph you see below, um, which is why small-bodied animals or lemurs living in environments like this have developed the use of seasonal heterothermy to combat these very extreme energetic constraints. So this phylogeny shows the heterothermic primates of Madagascar um, and the ones that are boxed in down below are the ones that use hibernation or um, heterothermy I guess is a more accurate term. And the best studied of these are the dwarf and the mouse lemurs. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on the dwarf lemurs, and specifically the two species that are depicted here, which are Chirogalius medius and Chirogalius crosslei. Um, and my research has looked at the interplay of physiology, ecology, and genomics, all in the context of metabolism. So you're going to be hearing a lot about metabolism. Um, and metabolism actually in animals that use hibernation um, sort of exists on a circannual cycle where during the active season um, where body temperature is roughly stable or homeothermic, the animals are using carbohydrate metabolism primarily. So they're burning through their, um, their carb stores, sugars and glucose from the fruits 
things like that that they're eating. And then they transition into a fattening state um, in which they experience behaviors like hyperphagia, which is eating a lot, um, reduced locomotion. Their meta metabolism starts to uh, slow down, and they, some species also so show changes in food preferences. From there, the animals then transition into this period of heterothermy. Um, during torpor, uh, they are heterothermic, as I mentioned before, and their metabolism shifts, shifts from being um, carbohydrate-based to primarily lipid-based. And then after the torpor season ends, they emerge, breeding takes place, and the whole cycle then starts anew. So uh, dwarf lemurs fall into the category of most hibernating species in that they are fat storing. But what's unique about the dwarf lemurs is that they store the majority of the fat in their tails, which is adorable. Um, and picture, pictured here, so this is the tail of a dwarf lemur that's primed and ready to go for hibernation. The tail is really, really fat. Um, and this one depicts an animal that has just emerged from hibernation, so the tail is very skinny. Um, so this is important for my research in that this tail fat uh, is relatively easy to obtain using uh, minimally invasive uh, approaches. And using the tail fat, then, we can look at genetic changes um, in this fat tissue to see how those are driving changes in physiology um, as we see uh, this yo-yo dieting on this annual basis, shown in this graph here. So we know from previous studies done in our model um, hibernating species that dramatic changes in physiology are in fact correlated with changes in gene expression. Um, so this is typically done by taking a tissue of interest, so whether it's liver, brain, in, in my case, fat tissue, um, and you sample that tissue at multiple time points throughout the year. Typically this is done during the active state um, before hibernation, then during a torpor bout, then during a period of interbout arousal, and again, when the animal emerges from um, hibernation during the post-hibernation active state. And then you can extract the RNA um, of your tissue of interest and sequence the gene or suite of genes or whole collection of genes if you're interested in looking at transcriptomic changes, um, and then compare those. And then these gene expression profiles are then like a snapshot in time. So then you can compare these snapshots to figure out which changes in gene expression are driving the changes in um, physiology. And from there you can take that one step further and use these snapshots as a way to compare between species um, to answer some intriguing evolutionary questions, um, such as, are the genes the same between species? Are they regulated in the same way? Um, and you can begin to start to look at the answer uh, to answer the question of whether or not the common ancestor of mammals was a hibernator or was not a hibernator. Um, and in the case of my research, then you can throw dwarf lemurs into the mix, which to date, this has not been done. So given what I've just described here, um, I sought to test three interrelated um, hypotheses regarding hibernation in dwarf lemurs. One is that changes in physiology are correlated with changes in gene expression in dwarf lemurs. Second is that dwarf lemur gene expression profiles will be similar to our model, model mammalian hibernators, um, the ones that have been studied so far, ground squirrels, black bears, um, certain bat species. And lastly, that genes that are differentially expressed are common mammalian genes, so that genes are found in the genome of all mammals. And I um, tested these hypotheses in uh, using two different projects. Project one was looking at a captive colony of fat-tailed dwarf lemurs here at the Lemur Center. And project two was looking at a population of wild Crossley's dwarf lemurs um, in Madagascar. And I will go into a little bit more detail about those. Okay, so firstly, I'm gonna talk about the captive study that I was doing with C. medius. 
Um, so C. medius, as most of you are probably aware, um, are about 150 to 300 grams, so these guys are roughly squirrel-sized, um, and they are nocturnal. They occur in the western and southern region, regions of Madagascar, although um, I think this distribution is <laughs> maybe incorrect according to Marina's talk that she just gave. She showed a different distribution, so I might be wrong. But um, in which case, they experience intense seasonality, um, what I showed you from Kurendi Forest. Uh, they hibernate in tree holes, as Marina mentioned. And as I mentioned before, there's a captive colony here at the Duke Lemur Center um, so that they're easy to study. All right, so uh, I was interested in sampling white adipose tissue from the tail. Um, and I sampled this tissue from three di distinct physiological states. Um, and this was done over the period of October to roughly February 2012 to 2013. Um, so Time point number one was taken during the active state. Body temperature was normal, around 37 degrees, and the average body weight was around 220 grams. Um, during my sampling time point two, this was during December of 2012. Um, this was during their fattening time point. Um, body temperature was around 37 degrees, um, and average body weight was 222 grams. Now, this might seem um, not as drastic as you would expect given their fattening time point. Um, this was due to the fact that I had an outlier animal who uh, was not gaining weight and in fact lost weight during this time point. So she was since removed from the downstream um, analysis. So this number should be much higher, but this was averaged across animals. Um, and lastly, uh, I sampled during an actual torpor bout where body temperature was around 16 to 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and as you can see from the body weight, these animals are starting to lose weight, so they're burning through their fat stores. Um, this was done in four individuals here at the Duke Lemur Center, two males and two females. Um, and I just put up this slide just to show you that um, what comes next to get from sampling tissue and extracting RNA to get actual results is very complicated bioinformatically. And this was the pipeline we used. I'm not gonna go into detail because it's very nitty gritty, but I just wanted to highlight the point that there's a lot of work that goes into the bioinformatics part of this project. And I could not have done this project without the help of our collaborators in Barcelona from the Alba Lab and specifically um, Jose Luis who some of you have met while he was here. Um, so basically using this bioinformatic pipeline, we can ex uh, identify gene expression profiles and then look at differences in gene expression. Um, and what we find is that in this captive colony of dwarf lemurs, we do find evidence of differential gene expression that are correlated with the physiological changes. Um, so we are just doing pairwise comparisons between our time points, and we're finding that um, during our active time, active versus torpor time point, we find 333 genes that are differentially expressed, fattening versus torpor, 246, um, and active versus fattening, only 11, which suggests that these, what we were sampling, were probably not distinct physiological states. Um, in this slightly confusing graph, I'm just gonna briefly walk you through it, um, but is just, we pulled out some interesting patterns that we saw from the data, and we find genes that are involved in metabolism, feeding behavior, circadian rhythms, um, and blood coagulation that show evidence of differential gene expression. Um, and so basically along the x-axis, uh, axis, you see uh, individual genes, and along the Y axis, you see um, just, it's reads, but that's just a measure, a, a measure of levels of gene expression. Um, so one particular group I wanted to point out, of course, is the metabolism genes. So the genes that I have circled down here are involved in lipid metabolism. So you can see um, that during the torpor time point, they're showing increased levels of expression, which you would expect if the animals are shifting their metabolism from carbohydrate to lipid. And conversely, um, this gene down here is involved in carbohydrate metabolism, when we say, and we see the opposite pattern. Um, so captive studies are great um, in many regards, but as 
any of you scientists out there know that every study has its cons. Um, some of the cons for this project are we have small sample sizes, um, the physiological responses aren't as extreme as what we would find in the wild, and the behavior can actually be affected by, um, by captivity or um, certain IACUC standards which I won't go into detail, <laughs> um, but they also have pros, including the fact that we can do sample collection under very carefully controlled settings. Um, and in the case of this project, I was able to use long longitudinal sampling methods in which I sampled from the same individual animal at multiple time points. Um, hibernation studies that have, done, ha have been done in this similar way have had to sacrifice their animals, which Obviously, we would never want to do that here. Um, so this lends itself nicely to longitudinal sampling methods. And then it also allows us to conduct comparative studies, um, whether it's comparing two different species or captive versus wild, which is my non-artificial segue into um, my project number two, which is um, studying trans cryptomics in the wild, um, looking at hibernation physiology in Crossley's dwarf lemurs. So um, this was done uh, in Sinjarivo Forest, uh, like Marina just mentioned. This is a roughly 225 hectare forest fragment, um, high altitude. And I was really relying on Marina to put up a graph of the climate data <laughs> for this field site, but she did not do that. So um, anyway, here's, here's where it is on the map. But basically the climate of Sinjarivo Forest is it's hot during the, <laughs> the summer and cold during the winter, very, very cold. She showed the frost. Um, and it also rains throughout the year. Um, so we're studying these hibernation patterns in highland dwarf lemurs, uh, which have adapted to withstand the cold of Sinjarivo. Um, these guys are a little bit bigger than the medius, 300 grams um, and 500 at their fattest. They're also nocturnal. Um, they occur in this small pocket of central eastern Madagascar, which again is probably should be revised given Marina's talk. Um, and they experience the coldest environment in Madagascar, in which case they hibern hibernate underground at a body temperature of between 12 and 15 degrees um, Celsius. And so I'm using the same experimental methodology as I did in the captive study, and I'm sampling at different time points throughout the year. Um, and this is actually body temperature that's pulled from one of our animals. This is representative of just one animal. But um, sampling during a fattening time point, and you can see here, I, was, I wasn't aware at the time of um, this very interesting uh, test drop sort of phase that this animal is experiencing in which Body temperature is pretty variable during this time, but they're technically still active. Um, and then we sampled during a torpor bout. And then, lucky for us, we were able to get the animals within, I think for all of my individuals that I'm use, using in this uh, data set, within one to two days of emergence. So they basically come out of their holes, we find them, and we take our samples, which was really awesome um, and very lucky. So uh, we did this. We, I have a uh, sample size of six individuals, um, two males and four females. And again, using the same sort of bioinformatic pipeline to look at gene expression profiles, we also find that Crossley's dwarf lemurs also show um, variable gene expression. Um, in this case, we're finding many, many more genes um, that are differentially expressed, and that is likely due to the fact that our sample sizes are much bigger. Um, there is a major difference between four animals versus six. Um, and so we actually have more statistical power to pull out more differential gene expression um, calls. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be focusing on the torpor versus fattening time point because it's, to me, the most physiologically interesting as well as given the fact that we see so many genes that are differentially expressed. And because we see much more evidence of differential gene expression, I am able to move from um, the data I showed for the first project in which I looked at individu individual specific examples of genes um, to use fun functional enrichment analysis to look more gene-centric to shift to this more biology-centric um, look at the behavior. So basically, I take my list of differential gene expressions, um, differential gene ex differentially expressed genes, I feed them into this um, database known as David, and it pulls, it 
basically clusters the genes that have similar function, are in the same pathways, um, and then it clusters them together into um, these groups, metabolism or protein folding, for example. And from here, um, the main result from this project was that protein-related pathways dominate the transcriptome of hibernating dwarf lemurs. So this is not an ideal table, but I just want to call your attention to these four um, group clusters that I highlight here. Um, the first time I got these results back, I looked at the data and my jaw kind of dropped. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Uh, I reran the analysis like 10 different times, still got the same uh, result. And the reason I was so shocked was because of this. So translation and um, cellular processes related to proteins are highly energetically expensive for an animal in general. And if you're talking about hibernation, um, in which case an animal is doing everything in its power to conserve energy, it wouldn't make sense that during hibernation you see this overabundance of processes related to protein um, translation. And also, previous studies have shown that protein translation is suppressed at around 18 degrees Celsius, so this dotted line I see here, or I, I show here. Um, so that's why I was so shocked. And then I started digging into the literature, and we see variable patterns in different hibernating species. So, for example, in black bears, um, their protein synthesis pathways are also upregulated during hibernation. Um, in ground squirrels, there are conflicting reports, and in bats, um, protein synthesis is typically, at least in the two reports that I found, is downregulated. Um, and I don't really have a perfect explanation for why this is, but my thought might be that it has something to do with the timing of sampling. So, for example, again, here's this graph with this magical 18 degrees Celsius dotted line showing when protein suppression takes place. Um, in the black bears, they typically hibernate at much um, higher body temperatures. They're actually only lowering their body temperature a few degrees um, below normal during hibernation. So it may be that protein synthesis is still taking place during hibernation because their body temperatures are much higher. Um, whereas if you're a ground squirrel or a bat, um, you're hibernating at much lower levels and maybe um, that's why you see conflicting reports. But again, it could be the timing of sampling. So if you were sampling from an animal that's you know, you think it's in torpor, but it's actually physiologically um, rewarming, um, that might show this confliction. And I think that's maybe what's happening in our data set is that the animals actually were starting to rewarm when we were sampling them, which is why we see protein synthesis is resuming and dominating um, what we see in the functional analysis. Um, but I'm still sort of tracking down some explanations for that. So. In conclusion, um, both our captive and field studies in dwarf lemurs support our overarching hypotheses in that both studies confirm that differential gene expression is, in fact, correlated with changes in physiology. Um, we find that differentially ex expressed genes are common mammalian genes. So we didn't find any gene that was dwarf lemur hibernation specific. Any gene that we found was differentially expressed um, had a counterpart in the human genome. Um, and lastly, and this is a very important point, is that dwarf lemurs are in, invoking differential expression of pathways that are already, already related to some aspect of mammalian life. Um, and this is really important for things like biomedicine. So conclusions that we find from this study um, can be used to look at things like human obesity, um, the human obesity epidemic, and if dwarf lemurs are using the same pathways and the same genes to do this yo-yo dieting, maybe that has some implications for um, combating human obesity and diabetes. Um, and then of course, for science fiction nerds like myself, the possibility of uh, space travel. So if humans already have the genetic machinery to be able to hibernate, um, then it's just a matter of I'm very, I'm simplifying this a lot, but figuring out how these genes are regulated in this very specific way in order to actually induce um, hibernation.
And so with that, I would like to thank um, everyone you see here, specifically Anne, of course, first off for, um, to Anne and Greg for organizing this great symposium um, and inviting me to be a speaker. I feel very honored. Um, and secondly, for um, not even batting an eye when I showed up in her lab and I said, I wanna study the genetics of hibernation. And she said, I don't really know anything about hibernation, but okay, let's do it. Um, so thank you for being very supportive throughout um, my project. And of course the Yoder Lab, past and present, many of which are here. Um, and a big thanks to Peter Klopfer, Marina Blanco, and the Alba Lab for just without your help, all of my projects would have failed. And of course, DLC staff and um, my funding sources. So with that, I will take any questions.